core. Core. You are listening to Core, a show on Code Zero Radio that plays bands located in the Fox Cities. A show to find and discover new music. Hosted by Andy McNamara. Uh, today's guest has been a part of the music scene for four decades. Uh, early on, he played in bands like the Rat Eaters and Urban Mutilation. In the early 90s, he formed legendary punk band Boris the Sprinkler. Today, he plays bass in a band called the Smart Shoppers. I'd like to welcome musician, roller derby announcer, and book author, Rev Norb Rozick to Fox City's Core. Norb, how you doing? I'm doing spectacularly. <laughs> By golly. You had a uh, show with the Smart Shoppers a couple nights ago at the Lyric Room. How did yeah. that go? Well, let me tell you, I, we had it like you know we were the opening act on a, on a absolutely stacked bill. It was it was the Dead Boys, or more correctly, the Dead Boy, or more correctly, the Live Boy of the Dead Boys, Cheetah Chrome, and the rest of the four fellows who make up the Dead Boys at this point in time, who are not in the original band, and the Briefs, who are magnificent and tremendous, and uh, and Susie Moon, who is also much better than I expected. So we only got like this this really like you know, short opening act on a four band bill on a Thursday night kind of set. And I could not manage to keep my bass playing sounds through the amplifier for all 25 minutes, which is a bit, you know, it, it is a bit discomforting. It is a bit discomforting. You'd think that if you had a bass and you only had to play it audibly for 25 minutes, you could get through that for Schlugener set. And uh, I, by the end of the set, something had happened. I don't know what the input jack or the amp or the this or the that or some other gosh darn musicianly thing. And I was reduced to just singing the bass line for the last song. Luckily, our songs are only 60 seconds long so we all got over it but it was a fine show a good thursday night would the the lyric room be one of your your more favorite places to, to perform well you know there aren't really that many places that we do perform in green bay wisconsin and i'd say right now the lyric room is at the top of the list by golly they're selling it it's being sold it's being sold i don't know what's going to happen in the coming year You're which right. is the next year <laughs> 2023 that's the year i'm talking about i have trepidation when, when was the, the first time you played at the lyric room I don't know, because it wasn't with the smart shoppers. It was probably with the onions, and it was probably quite some time ago. Uh, you've been around for quite a while, and I mean that in a good way. I am superannuated. <laughs> you started in uh, music in the early 80s. Like, what, what got you, and we're going to kind of go through the whole spectrum of, of your career. But Make it happen, Daddy-o. <laughs> what, what got you into music? What was the spark that, that made you think, well, this is what I want to do? Uh, same thing everybody else does. You get some records, you're like, holy crap, I can do this. Let's. I, mean, I couldn't really do it at the time, but you're like, I want to do this. This is great. Because like, up to about age 13, all I wanted to do, like my sole goal in life, my sole stated objective with my entire existence was to become a famous comic book artist or even a not famous comic book artist. I just wanted to draw superheroes punching people in the mouth. And then you're like 13 and you start hitting puberty and you get records like, yeah, I'm a comic book, screw that. I'm, I'm going to be in a band, by golly. And I think a lot of people have that idea. But luckily, I fell into the camp of punk rock where you don't need there's a very small barrier to entry. It's not that hard to like, you know, get a $50 bass. And even if you don't even know how to tune it, you can be like, well, if I find a guy with a guitar and I find a kid with drumsticks, we can be a band and we can just walk around saying we're a band and so on and so forth. And I think in eighth grade, me and my friends said we were in a band called the Atomic Riveters. We talked about, as children do, as 13-year-olds do, you talked about how you're going to be in a band someday. We're going to take our band picture on the monkey bars here. And then you try to like pose and look all cool and tough. And, uh, you know, you sort of have this sort of fantasy thing and then there's this gulf there's this gulf between what you think you you, you can possibly do and you don't really know how to achieve it and then you know you sort of get the, the punk rock thing and you start you know sort of filling in the dots because you you sort of got the impression that you could do it more than I think you would if I would have like fallen into listening to Ingwie Malmsteen or whatever that dude's name is where I would have to you know practice and have talent and things like that so I think that just sort of happened did I answer the question yeah, you did. I don't remember it, so good. <laughs> Let's well, move on. When you started, you were into, I'm guessing, like, I know you're into the Beatles, like, in the Ramones. That comes up sometimes, yes. Yeah. Now, when you're into punk, is it kind of like a, an unwritten rule that you have to say you don't like the Beatles? I don't really know if that was an unwritten rule, because, like, the Beatles were my favorite band from about age six or seven until... I, I, I think... They, they, were, they were my favorite band, but they like weren't a band like when I was a kid because you know they were this sort of relic from a bygone era. And then I was I was not so much into the the, the music from the era that I grew up in is the seventies. I the hard rock I thought was really sort of largely unsatisfying, and the music on the radio was at that point in time it was like the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac and things of which it was sort of adult 
I don't know, they listen to this music and they sat around on their waterbed smoking pot and I don't know, driving around in vans or whatever the hell adults did at that point in time. And that really was not my scene. So I, I really like the music of the 50s and the, the early to mid 60s. And uh, as you start sort of aging and you're like, you get to be about like 11 or 12, you start thinking, well, the whole Beatles thing, you know, that it just sort of seems like I'm worshiping. I'm, I'm sort of one of those Don Quixote. No, what's the other guy? Uh, what, what's that? What's the, that T.S. Eliot thing about the guy, J. Miniver, Miniver Chibi, Miniver Miniver Chibi, you think that you're sort of living in some sort of weird renaissance fair where you like this ancient thing. So then I started thinking, well, I need sort of an, like an, an active favorite band. I need a favorite band that's still sort of a band that I can sort of back and, and get behind because, you know, kids are wearing their black t-shirts with their glitter Aerosmith logos on and stuff. So uh, at first I thought that would be sweet because I really like Sweet's earlier, like Mike Chapman, Nicky Chin, glam rock stuff, you know, Ballroom Blitz and Vox on the Road and stuff like that. And I got to get the Wink album, uh, give us a Wink album rather. And I thought that was a little bit, I don't know, it was a little bit mature for my taste that's one where they start writing their own songs and so on and so forth i suppose you could like liken that to the monkey's headquarters or maybe you couldn't whatever so i thought well maybe sweet are going to be like the modern band that I, I get behind but then they sort of went into this sort of tinny sort of faux hollies pop thing with love is like oxygen and i didn't like that so much so then i sort of started like kind of getting behind aerosmith like well maybe aerosmith will be my acting favorite band and i'll just sort of put the beatles in the past but i couldn't quite do it because aerosmith weren't quite good enough to you know move the needle all the way but then i discovered cheap trick and i'm like okay cheap trick are my favorite band and the Beatles are just going to be kind of like the thing that was my favorite band alumnus. I'm just going to sort of put them aside and have them kind of be my... They'll, they'll have this exalted position. They'll be like... Like when they give those awards, there's some like award, I don't know, for like the best venue and Red Rocks always wins it. And so they finally just said, okay, Red Rocks is no longer eligible for competition. We're just going to call it the Red Rocks Award. Well, that's sort of how I felt with the Beatles. Like, okay, we're, I'm just going to put them to the side and Cheap Trick are going to be my acting favorite band and they're going to be this thing in the past. So then when the Ramones came along, the Ramones displaced Cheap Trick as my favorite band. But then I still, you know, still like the Beatles. And is there an unwritten rule? I think there's an unwritten rule that you have to sort of make fun of the Beatles and you can't take them too seriously and you, you, you need to lampoon them when at all possible, but I don't think you necessarily need to hate the Beatles, as evinced by the fact that on the second Boys album, or is it the first Boys album? I think it's the second one they cover. I, that's the first one. On the first Boys album, they cover I'd Call Your Name by the Beatles, and by golly, I don't know. By golly, that's it. That's my theory. That All that was winding up to that, that they the boys covered I Call Your Name. And I think somebody else covered a Beatles song at one point in time in this world. That was a good answer, and it... Nor before the show started, I, I know I said be close to the mic. I, I don't know how to handle this audio here. You're you're a very like powerful speaker. <laughs> you're killing Shall me. Shall I back off a little bit? <laughs> maybe, All maybe. Right. Um, but it, it's it's a good answer. It's you got a, me wound up. <laughs> I'm usually not up at this hour. Thank you for moving. Thank you for moving the set the, the the set time the start time to accommodate my second shift schedule. Well, yeah, I know you're again. You're a busy guy. That yeah yeah. <laughs> So with, you talk for a while. Okay. So when you started, um, you know, you had the Red Eaters and then uh, Urban Mutilation. Suburban Mutilation. Oh, Suburban yeah, Mutilation. Yeah, we weren't tough right. enough to be Urban Mutilation. And that that record, I'll jump ahead a little bit, came out as a Record Store Day release um, like four years ago? It, somehow, Mike from Beer City Records got the crappy album we recorded when we were about 18 years old, got that reissued as a Record Store Day release, which is, I mean, if you've ever heard the crudity of that album, it cost $86 to record in a basement in Nina in 1980, January 1984, I think, and... Uh, sort of released it myself and then somehow somehow I, I don't know how, I don't know exactly how the industry works here but uh, somehow Mike from Beer City Records got that as a record store day release which is freaking weird did, did you like run around to all the record stores and, and just to see it in the in the stores because that's pretty awesome and how often does that happen not not to many people not often enough I'll tell you that <laughs> I mean, it was obviously it was a you know it was a big thrill when I was when it first came out because that was you know first record I was ever on or at least the first album that you know I we put out and you go to the record stores you go here's five copies and pay me or don't pay me or however <laughs> it works just put it in the store and put a price tag on it and then you're all just a Twitter you know you got your record in like four stores or whatever and you're all, you're all tingly inside then you find a distributor and you you get your records distributed and then they don't pay you either and then you're done the eighties good times for you. Uh, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Uh, Reagan was president, and that meant that uh, if you were young, you didn't have any money, and you, they also raised the drinking age. Luckily, I stayed one step ahead of that. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, you're young and you're broke and you're drunk, and that's how the 80s went. 1992, you start Boris the Sprinkler. 
Yes, I didn't actually phone Boris the Sprinkler. The other guys talked me into it. Uh, so you were the last I was the last member. original member to join. They asked me to join, and I refused. <laughs> I, I, I dug in my heels, and I was like, no, I'm, I'm, done, I'm done with this fall de roll. I'm done with this, this, this claptrap. Leave me alone. I simply wish to, be, I, I wish to be a hermit. I wish to sit in my apartment and read by myself and perhaps eat a ham sandwich every now and again. And they talked me into like coming back and like jamming, jamming, because like we had the, the guitar player and the bass player and the drummer, because that's how bands work, and the bass player wasn't around. And just Paul, number one, the guitar player, said, well, why don't you come over to Ron's basement and I just, just play bass? We'll just spend the afternoon. We'll just goof off. It'll be you and me and Ron. Because he'd, he'd invited me over to see the band to see if I wanted to join them. And I said, like, no, I have absolutely no interest in joining your band. Please go away. And so, like, they kind of, like, talked me into, like, coming over and you know, we're just jamming. We're playing whatever the hell it is that comes to mind. And we're having just a nice Sunday afternoon, just hanging out with friends, sitting in the basement, playing music. And then all of a sudden, down the stairs walks Eric number one. And I'm playing his bass through his amp. And I'm like, holy crap, i got to give him his bass. But by then, I was having fun. Then there was nothing left for me to do but sing. And that's how that worked. And it instantly clicked. You guys clicked right away. And we were just, yeah, we were just like, I don't know. We were just goofing. I, I thought we were just goofing off on a Sunday afternoon. I didn't know we were going to be a band. I thought we were just killing time. So eventually you decided, well, we should record. We should put this on CD. Or uh, you know, well, or that's how the band thing works. You want to <laughs> you want to leave those artifacts of your of your rock and roll brilliance, your obvious brilliance. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you want to make records. That's what you do. At least that's what I want to do. Now, back in that, that time, like, obviously different than now, like, when you're trying to promote a record, you obviously, like, are very good at networking. You're a people person. At least you seem like it. I'm not a people person. Interesting. So, I don't think. Would you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? Uh, I, th I think I'm pretty naturally introverted, actually. But, you know, that doesn't really work for you if you're in a band. So you got to kind of kick it into the other gear every now and again. Did that maybe contribute to like the the awesome like the whole Norb kind of? I am aura? not my own psychologist. You would have to psychoanalyze me to figure <laughs> out the, the you know the, the nature of my deviance. Do you feel it's easier to sort of like get out there in front of people when when you're dressed up and? It's really easy to get out in front of people if you've got the microphone and you're going to talk. I'm, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say that and I'm going to say this and you might go, yay, you might go, boo, but by golly, I got the microphone and you're going to react to it. If you actually have to listen to what other people say and you have to interact with them and, you know, do the whole... It's the whole like Vulcan mind meld that you're supposed to have. Like if you're a social worker or something, you got to kind of get inside people's heads. That gets all kind of weird to me. You know, it gets, makes me uncomfortable and kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies. So I just sort of broadcast in a one-way one -way stream. So were you doing like, Boris was known right away for, you know, your outfits and, and that stage, like personality. You've got a huge personality. And when you're watching. I got to something. <laughs> <laughs> when, you're, when you're watching Boris the Sprinkler, like your your stage presence is very magnetic, and and you're very um, you're very engaging with the crowd. When when some people get up there, they just stand there. You're all over the place, and right right out of the gate, was that kind of sort of like just something that felt right for the band, or is that something you had to sort of practice? Um, well, there was like a band I was in between Suburban Mutilation and Boris the Sprinkler called Depo Provera in the last half of the 80s. And, you know, so that's, I, I was I was sort of a bass player slash singer, whatever, in Suburban Mutilation, but then Depo Provera, I was just a singer. And then you kind of, I don't know, you kind of get into what feels natural for you on stage, so that's sort of how it worked. Plus, you know, if you're in a band, you are... Uh, it, it, well, I don't want, I don't want to like reference the Chris Jericho Appreciation Society from wrestling or anything, but you're sort of an entertainer. You're supposed to keep people engaged and you're supposed to like pre present something that people people are going to pay money and they're going to, you know, you don't want them just sort of standing around or watching you under obligation or doing some sort of thesis on musical research. They want to come see something. They want to have fun. They want to be engaged. They want to, you know, I don't know, they want to have a good time on Friday night or whatever the heck it is. So it's your duty to facilitate that. And if you're the front man, you don't have a hell of a lot to do. You don't have to remember how this songs go on bass you don't remember how, remember how to play guitar load your drums that's your job that's what you should be doing so i just sort of think that that's kind of i'm just doing my job basically were there any bands at the time that were similar to, to boris none that i can think of everybody at that point in time was kind of serious about music and they would they, they were serious and they had you know acoustic guitars that plugged into amplifiers and it was sort of getting very musicianly like i'm a musician and i'm a i'm an important artist you know acknowledge me recognize me we are local musicians we are banded together because we are a community and we do this and we do that 
it, it all seemed a bit dry and there was always this sort of this sort of undercurrent that you had to you need to support us you need to uh, you need to come out and see the local music even though we're not entertaining but you have to do it because that's your obligation as a citizen I am a musician and therefore I get free reign and I I am, I am should be I am I am due a stage and an opportunity and a venue to express myself and then you as the crowd are required to come see me and things like that and it just the, the transactional nature just wasn't there. It didn't really, I didn't, you didn't get all that much motivation to go out on a Saturday night and see somebody standing there dressed in street clothes, playing some arpeggio on a guitar, looking at their shoes or whatever. It just, it's not entertaining. So was there a, an instant reaction to Boris? Yeah, people hated us. It was great. <laughs> well, you know, what I find interesting is like, I, I heard of Boris, but I wasn't familiar with your music, but I knew who you were. You know, I knew how you looked. Like when I would see you out in public, I knew you, it's like there's Norb, you know, because people knew who you guys were. And I, I think that was one of, the, one of the important things about um, music, I guess, is it is partly image, isn't it? Um, there's certainly a component of that nature. I mean, I don't think that's required of everybody, but I think, I mean, to a certain point when you're, when you're a, a prepubescent teenager and you're dreaming of rock and roll stardom or whatever it is at least me you know you're thinking well what's the album cover going to look like when we were kids and we didn't really have a band and we just said we were a band called the atomic riveters you're thinking well where are we going to take our album cover photo right you're not figuring out well where am i going to get a you know a guitar from or how am i going to learn to play or where are we going to get gigs or you know are we going to write songs you're thinking where are we going to take the band photo over here by the monkey bars how should should i have a stubble you know should i pose with a cigarette should i pose with a white crayola in case my mom sees the photo you know you're, you're I, at least i'm thinking about that and i'm i'm sort of a graphic designer -y kind of guy so i'm thinking like well what color is the text going to be and at first it doesn't matter because you don't have any money so it's going to be black and white then you start thinking wow if i could only add a second color what color should the letters be should they be red and you're seeing this stuff in your head i want to be a band that's got a black and white photo with red letters yeah that's my thing that's going to be my image and then i, I don't know i uh, to me, that's always a huge component of it. Um, obviously, more so than musical talent because I never practice and I'm not that good of a musician. But I, you know, I kind of try to do. I try to pull my weight as far as like image and design goes. So you, how's my hair? <laughs> it's still on. It's looking good. Very well. So Boris starts to uh, take off. You guys end up doing some touring. We did. And then you ended up playing with probably some some heroes of yours. At the, also true. Yes. I need more creamer. If, you, if you're wondering what the, what the lapse in my concentration is, that's, uh, I need more creamer. I'm stirring it with my finger. So when, when things started to take off, then all of a sudden did, it, you're probably seeing your CDs in stores at that point. And was there interest that you could feel like the, the interest kind of building and building? Yeah, you definitely, it definitely, you know, it, like like anything, it's you, it's you should have some sort of a trajectory where you think things are going up. So, you know, things were things were going from just the local band to got to tour around. We got to play. I don't know. We we did one tour that really sort of helped us along. It was our first first time we were really ever touring out of the state. It was with the the Riverdales and the Mr. T Experience. And the Riverdales were sort of Ben Weasel's interim project when he thought Screeching Weasel were broken up. And at first we had just broken a broken at first we had just booked a boris tour by ourselves it was a little tour on the east coast and then i was talking to weasel and he's like well i want the riverdales to tour can we just get on your tour and i was like yeah sure he's like okay we'll just split the money 50 50 i'm like all right cool and then the mr t experience were talking to to ben and they were like well we want to get on this tour so this went from being like this little bitty boris tour that we had booked this humble thing just for us to get out of the uh, you know get out of wisconsin then it became this like this big thing where we were you know this tour was selling out like the rat in boston and maxwell's and hoboken and all this other crap and then after that, we were like, we were kind of set pretty well after that because all these people saw us and we sold all these records over there. And I don't know, what, what, what is I saying? Yes, a trajectory. Yes, you're going uphill. You want to go up, 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 ever upward. Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. That is a the horrible misapplication of biblical verse, but we're just going to roll with it because it's early. And were you on the Riverdale's album? I was. I was doing, I did the, I did the announcer thing on Fun Tonight. Recorded at Sonic Iguana Studios in Lafayette, Indiana. I think I, I heard a little bit about that on uh, Christopher Olson's You Don't Say podcast when you were you on don't there say. About, <laughs> about seven seven or eight years ago, I think he did that. Wow. I believe it. It sounds it sounds accurate. I have no reason to <laughs> doubt you. Yeah, it was pretty strange. I, I was in the video for it too, but the video kind of just went nowhere. It was really weird. Ben had uh 
but had this gentleman, Bruce LaBruce. He was a apparently a, a well-known Toronto gay filmmaker. And uh, Ben knew this guy, and he was really just enamored with the fact that he knew this, this fellow who had directed movies that were apparently... Uh, uh, apparently of note in that that manner of I, I'm no cinemaphile, so apparently these were these are fairly well known movies in that sort of genre. And he had him direct the video, and apparently MTV decided the video was. And here I quote: Here I quote Ben quoting MTV, which is probably not a direct quote. Too gay, because uh, he had these teenage boys bouncing on the bed and things like that. So the video was never actually shown anywhere, and I don't think it's on MTV. But it was like it was like a real video. It was shot in some warehouse on Domin Street, and there was a crew setting up sets and stuff and i was really a dick about being in the video and i told ben i'm glad i'm gonna take off work on a tuesday and come down and be in your video um unless i can do it unless i can like you know get my part over first because all are playing at the metro and I'll, I'll come down if i can be in the video and then i can you just let me go and i can go see all and then i can come back then i'll take a day off of work so we did so i was like I, because of my my prima donna demands my my announcer part follow it and dig the gate jethro this is your 99 percent politically correct blah 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 that was the first thing that they shot for the video, and then I just left, and I went to go see Paul. What's my point? Well, I, I agree with you, whatever you said. <laughs> well, I mean, so, I mean, how is Ben Weasel? As a, I mean, I hear stuff about Ben Weasel. Like, I haven't talked to him in about 20 years or something like that. I don't know. He did. I don't know. He's, he's one of those people that... I don't know. Once in a while, you could just perhaps get a lit... A, a might pissed at him, or you get... I don't know. We just... He did something that pissed me off, and I was just sort of like, you know, <laughs> bah humbug. I don't know if I can really swear too much on this podcast, but it's sort of like bah humbug. Now, most of the Boris albums, with the exception of the last one, were recorded at Simple Studios, which Eric Number 2. You're owned. absolutely correct. Former Boris bass player, Eric Number 2. Uh, was it kind of nice recording in a, in a studio that was owned and run by somebody in the band to take off some of the heat as far as like the, the meters ticking? I don't know if he charged himself for recording it was uh um, yeah it is very nice i mean when you can record in your bass player's basement and we recorded with him before he was in the band and that was before he had a studio he would just sort of he had this tape deck and some microphones he would come over so we recorded our first album was partially recorded in our uh, apartment where we were practicing so the drums he decided that the i don't know it was one of those sort of weird things where he decided the kitchen had the best acoustics for drums and then you put cushions all over everywhere and it was sort of this clandestine thing but then he bought a house and he turned the basement into a studio and then we recorded there and i think at first we recorded for free and then i decided okay this is kind of bs so we paid him like 20 or we paid him like 50 percent of whatever it was he was asking and then i think eventually we paid everything i don't know where we're going with that yeah but i mean it's nice but like boris didn't really spend a lot of time in the studio so it's not like we're agonizing over tracks we were just in and out and it was, it was pretty swift anyway so it's it's not like we would have taken any longer or any shorter if we were paying for studio time but it was more convenient to be able to pop in and pop out so how did you get the the nickname rev norb rev norb uh, well probably... my name is norbert so you know that's <laughs> sort of that that's half the question and when i was about 16 i got myself ordained through the mail so i became a reverend so then i was rev norb rev norb whatever you want to call me truth and advertising that is that is who i be <laughs> did were you like marrying somebody or something i, I wasn't marrying anybody at the time i just okay. wanted to get you know, ordained because I was 16 years old and I thought that was funny. But I, since then, I have done a bunch of marriages because apparently I do do the devil's work. <laughs> is that something you have to renew every so often? Or? No, it is not. And in point of fact, since then, I got ordained by three other churches. So I've been ordained by four churches so far. Do you get a certificate each time? I think you usually have to pay extra for the certificate. Okay. Except for the United Church of Bacon. I think they sent me a certificate for free because bacon is real and money isn't. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a favorite... Out of the Boris catalog, a favorite CD. Yes, I like the Suck album, which was, you know, actually the first one, I think, that was released on regular 12-inch, not picture disc vinyl. And I just, the, the cover was really inspired by the Revillo's Rev Up cover, because I don't know if you're familiar with the Revillo's Rev Up album, but it's got letters that are about this high in pink, and it says Rev Up really big. So I was thinking, I need a really short album title that I can put in big pink letters. I want the letters as big as possible. So Suck was like, the best descriptor I could find. So it's got really big pink letters on the cover. That made me really happy. And uh, I think that record sounds the best. And it's got pretty good material on it, I think, for the most part. And that was, uh, looking at my notes here, that was on Go-Kart Records. That was on Go-Kart Records from New York, New York. I see in Bulge Records, I see. Bulge Records was me, me, that myself, was and I. So what was the difference between going from your record label to 
like a, a label like go kart. Well, when you're on a label like go kart, it really it it really didn't matter all that much in the grand scheme of things. But when you were we were on a label like go kart, we could get you know you could get an advance. Your record label sends you a check, and then it's you know it's got zeros on the end of it, and you're all like happy. We got all this money, hooray! And then you split it four ways, and you're like, okay, well that's you know whatever. I mean, you can buy a couple cases of beer with it, but it's not like you're. I mean, for for our kid, for a band that never toured, for a band that always had day jobs, it was you know a nice little chunk of money. But then of course you don't get any royalties until you get your advance paid off so then it all probably is a wash in the end but when we were on go-kart well we could do th- cool things that you couldn't, couldn't ordinarily do like we were the label mates of the buzzcocks for a while buzzcocks a band that i've been listening to since i was 14 years old they had an album on go-kart from 2002 or 2000 or something around there 1999 actually called modern so we got to do like this sort of leg of this this tour with them it was called the go-kart across america and they had two buses and they had the buzzcocks in one bus and they had the lunatics and down by law who are also go-kart recording artists in the other bus and then they had to have like you know regional go-kart acts fill in the other slots so we got to play in you know chicago and milwaukee and green bay and minneapolis and blah 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 with uh, on, on the go-kart tour and that was cool because how often do you get to say that you toured even though it was you know it was less than a week with, with you know your your teenage idols the buzzcocks or whatever that was pretty cool and you know once in a while there would be something cool like there'd be this big go-kart kiss and cousins weekend in new york city and they your label would fly they would fly us out to new york and we could play a set and they'd fly us back like we were just a bunch of jet setting hot shots but apart from that it's really not that different and they had like a publicist for like the first six months and that all comes out of your them, that somehow you somehow you wind up paying for this out of your royalty somehow but you, then you get your advance so it's like you're not concerned because you don't think that you're going to get any more money anyway but you know we would get reviewed in places that we wouldn't ordinarily get reviewed in if i was just putting it out because i wouldn't have any contact with this so there'd be some you know some weekly entertainment newspaper in florida you get to see the reviews from there if they liked you or they didn't like you whereas you wouldn't have that if you were just putting it out yourself because what the hell do you know about weekly entertainment newspapers in florida so it was cool you did a, an album with the Absolutes, which, if, you know, it's Justin Perkins, Tim Schwager. I mean, Justin is, is still really heavily involved in the music scene as far as mystery room mastering. He certainly uh, is. He's like the guy to go to in Wisconsin if you need, and the country if you need something mastered. Uh, that experience, you guys did, you did uh, an album with them of Bob Dylan covers in the style of the Ramones. Well, I don't know if it was in the style of the Ramones necessarily, but it was, you know, it was along those lines. How how did that, like, who had that idea, who approached to, and like, it's just, it's kind of like a a random kind of thing. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because this answer has just been burning a hole in my pocket all day long. Uh, Simple Studios, which was the studio that was run by former Boris bass player, Eric number two, uh, Justin used to be an engineer and work recording there. He was like one of the guys that Eric brought in when when Eric had the studio in his basement. Then he moved it off site, off premises, and then you got he, Eric has this paper mill job, like a good Wisconsinite. So we, he would, you know, you got to try to keep the studio in use so you can make your money back and pay your rent and all that kind of stuff. So he would bring in other people to record things. So he brought in Justin Perkins, and Justin was recording people there. And I said, I believe I may have had a few beers in me that I wanted to do a Bob Dylan tribute album, and I wanted to record it from my car which was a pontiac and i bob dylan had that song from a buick six i wanted to call it from a pontiac seven i don't know why i thought it would be really funny because justin and i were talking and justin was talking about recording somebody outside that somebody had i don't know for for whatever reason they got a good sound by running a microphone outside and i'm like well you know i got a sunroof in my car i want to sit in my car and play a bop Again, there were a few beers involved. I want to record a Bob Dylan tribute album. Me sitting in the car. I'm going to play all the instruments inside my car. You run the mics through the sunroof of my Pontiac Sunfire, and you know, and we'll just do that. It'll it'll be great. It'll, this is going to be the greatest album ever. You know, because who has ever recorded an album in their car before? Not me. All right, I haven't either. I, I didn't do that either. So anyway, this this sort of mutated. This is like this this drunken idea. And Justin's like, yeah, that, you know. Well, you know, Justin, he's a very low key guy. Yeah, that sounds good. You know, <laughs> sort of gives you that encouraging nod. And you're like, all right, cool. I got Justin's seal of approval. But um, then he said, well, you know, if you want to record it and you want want somebody else to play things, Justin realizing I'm sort of got limited capacity as a musician, he said, well, he, he'd offer his services. And then he sort of you know offered offered the services of a. Uh, 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 
you know, the rest of his band. And pretty soon, pretty soon it, it went from just being me recording some sort of ridiculous thing in my car to being like uh, a full band recording Bob Dylan tribute album. And it was pretty cool. Um, we practiced once. We practiced once on a Monday, on a Monday somewhere in Appleton in the, the garage of a gentleman from the band Antifreeze who were on Fat Records way back when. Um, we, we did one practice on a Monday night. We recorded the album that weekend. We played three shows. Or maybe I got the timeline wrong. We, we, we did one practice, then we recorded the record. Then we got signed to Alternative Tentacles, Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedys label, put out the record, we played three shows. No, we practiced a second time, played three shows, and broke up. <laughs> that was Knob Dylan and the Knob Solis, ladies and gentlemen, 2006. Were you a fan of the Absolutes before doing that project? Well, heck, everybody loves the Absolutes, <laughs> don't they? I concur. Very well. <laughs> so that's pretty, that's a... a I mean, again, a pretty random thing to have in your discography. It is pretty random, you know, and it was, it was great. That's one of my favorite records I was ever on just because those guys are so freaking talented. Like, that's, we practiced once. Those guys probably didn't need to practice at all. They just, you know, like, okay, here's the song. And it's, There was one, one song on their site, Motorcycle Nightmare, off of uh, the fourth Bob Dylan album. Uh, those guys had never heard it because I gave them a tape of the songs I wanted to cover, but that one wasn't on it. And I think we're going to do Bob Dylan's 116th stream, 115th stream off of... Anyway, I, th- it, that song was too long, so it was just like, well, let's just do Motorcycle Nightmare. Uh, it goes like this. Play this, play, play this whole thing nine times and we'll be done. And those guys are just like, okay, blah, 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 blah. played it, knocked it out, never heard the song before. Um, it's a talented bunch of fellows, pretty easy to work with. It allowed me to, you know, do to invent ways of playing rhythm guitar. Like I would take a tambourine and I would just, I'd make the chord shapes with my left hand and I'd bang the strings with the tambourine in my hand with the other one. Or just, I just slap the guitar. I, I just sort of do whatever the heck I wanted to, and I could do it because I had the obsoletes behind me, and those guys could do anything. You've made it to band reaction, Norb. Band reaction. Band reaction. As you know from watching previous Fox City's Chorus, this is where we play a clip from a previous uh, guest, and then we get your reaction. All right. This is uh, Amos Pitch. He was on a few weeks ago. I've heard of him. Do I put this on? Yeah, you probably want to. (laughs) Yeah. Band reaction. Band reaction. I went on tour with this band from LA thinking I was going to play drums for the rest of the year, basically uh, being hired to play for this band. Then the guitarist of this band fell down a flight of stairs and broke his arm in like 13 places, tried to play the next show in San Francisco and it was just too excruciating. And so their record label got me an Amtrak ticket home, which was the worst few days of my life, I think, because Right before getting on the train, I bought just this humongous bag of apple trips, and I ate, like, half the bag. For some reason, not realizing that apple chips are just dehydrated apples, so I was eating, like, you know, 20 apples and just got the worst diarrhea of my life sitting on this train and going back and forth to the the bathroom for, like, three days all the way from Portland, Oregon to Milwaukee. I'm sure Amos likes me playing that clip. Uh, but anyways, have, have you had, like, what's your reaction to that? Have you had experiences like that touring around or doing gigs? I, I have never had experience with apple chips. I might have had a banana chip or two in my life, but I, I, I don't really know that I've ever been trapped on an Amtrak train with a gut full of rapidly hydrating diarrhea producing apples before. Uh, I had one experience trying to ride Amtrak. It was a bunch of crap. I was in Spokane, Washington, visiting a friend, and I was going to take the train to Seattle, and it was like the midnight train. Midnight train to Georgia? No, midnight train to Seattle. And um, it's one of those things where if the train is too, it's, the train goes from Chicago to Spokane to Seattle. They turn it around, it goes to Spokane, Chicago, it goes back and forth. I think it's called the Hiawatha Line, but I may be incorrect. But uh, if the train is too late from Chicago to Spokane, instead of sending it late to Seattle, they just keep that train in Spokane, so then it's on time going back to Chicago. So in the middle of the night, they finally decided that the train um, from Chicago didn't get to Spokane in time, so they were going to cancel the train from Spokane to Seattle. Mind you, now it's like 2 in the morning, and I'm sitting in the Amtrak station, Without diarrhea, as far as I can remember, they decided they're going to put us on buses. So they get this bus, and I wind up like getting squished against the side because I'm sitting uh, next to some morbidly obese person with crutches. And this guy is totally mashing me into like this. So this guy is radiating, bo- radiating body heat of like 211 degrees Fahrenheit. And the outside of the train, because it's cold outside because it's winter, is like freezing. So I'm freezing on one side, and I'm like overheated on the other side. I'm mashed between these two things. And I'm trying to turn my molecules into superconductors so I can get some of that heat from 
from the left side of my body and some of the cold from the right side of my body. I'm trying to get my molecules vibrating so I can actually maintain some sort of a healthy thermal equilibrium, but I couldn't, and eventually they stopped in Waxahachie or Tsuchibuchi or someplace where they make apples, and I got off the bus because I'm like, I don't want to get back on the bus, and then they had a second bus, so I got on that bus, and there was nobody in it. There's like three people in this bus, and then that was cool, but... uh I don't know. I, I you know, I, I can't imagine the Amtrak experience being enhanced by diarrhea, although my Amtrak experience was such that I never rode the Amtrak, so I guess I couldn't tell you. It's a good answer. Uh, when you were touring around with Boris, though, did you have any logistical problems with um, travel or anything with like, like I'm, I don't know if you stayed at hotels most of the time or if you stayed at crash where you we could. were really big fans of motel six because they had that 1-800 number and this was before a cell phone so you could go to any pay phone on the planet that 1-800 for motel six and like book book your motel six like a day or two in advance i always got the little you know there, there was a little guide that they would have in the lobby and you just take that and you just kind of you just kind of figure it out i you know i mean motel six is what it is but with that guide was really handy and that 800 number was really handy because I was pre-cell phones and pre-Google and all that stuff. So you could just sort of book your stuff like a couple days in advance and everything went well. Uh, logistical travels, the only thing I, the only experience I had that was similar to Amos's with the Apple chips was we were in California and we decided to spend the afternoon in Tijuana and I sampled some of the local cuisine. Some of the local cuisine, some of the local tacos, which, you know, I, you know, you speculate all you want about the quality of the, the, the ground animal corpse that's in the tacos. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was not agreeing with me at all. So it's about 100 million degrees, and I was sitting out in some porta potty in the middle of central California doing stuff and nice things just didn't think. Well, use your imagination. I don't think we need to go there with all the gory details, but that's what I remember. Just the Tijuana tacos having their way with me. I like your shirt. Of Espen to Venus shirt. That's I, a really comfortable shirt. So Boris, you guys hadn't been playing for like 18 years and then decided, let's uh, let's get the band back together. Like, was that just something that you just you missed being in Boris? Or was it like, let's get out, let's get out there and, and you know, get into this, the current scene or kind of update ourselves? Or what was the, the motivation for Boris? Like the, the lineup that we, the, the current lineup of Boris was the lineup from like 1997-ish, 1996-ish, the, uh, the mega anal Boris album uh, lineup. So uh, the four of us hadn't played together since I think 1999, since Paul number two's last show. And Boris continued until like 2003 with a variety of lineups and personnel and stuff, and then called it a day. And, you know, people would occasionally, hey, could you guys play a show? No, we can't. We're not a band. Go jump in the lake, et cetera, et cetera. So like Insubordination Fest in Baltimore had contacted me for a few years. Like, do you guys want to play? No, I don't want to play. We're not a band. Go away, blah, blah, blah. And then for some reason in 2009, I was thinking, you know, they, they asked, well, do you want to play? You want to come to Baltimore and play? And I was like, yeah, why the hell not? I'll, you know, I'll kind of, I'll see if I can do this. So I kind of had to slowly breach the subject. Like, you know, you kind of figure out who you got to have in the band and who not, and who's going to get along with whom, because not every lineup of Boris meshes correctly. Shall we say in People, you know, they're, they're sort of like, well, I'll only do it if that guy does it. And that guy will only do it if this guy does it. This guy will only do it if the other guy does it. So I got to kind of get all the dominoes going in the right order that everybody is like, yeah, okay. So we, we, I, I, somehow I, I sweet talked everybody into like doing this 2009 reunion show in Baltimore at Insubordination Fest, put out by your friends at Insubordination Records, and uh, we played. And it wasn't exactly a logistical triumph, you know. It wasn't a, it was not the excellence of execution that Bret Hart uh, would, you know, would, would, you know, perform in the wrestling ring. But you know, we did, it and it was a lot of fun. That was cool. And then. You know, after that, we sort of went into remission for years and years and years. And then I think it was uh, 2017, Time Bomb Tom, legendary Green Bay promoter and record store worker, was having his 50th birthday party. And he's like, the Boris want to play. And, I, you know, we were always like, yeah, we'll play another show. But then you're thinking, well, I don't know. You know, our bass player lives in New Jersey. And, you know, our drummer lives in Door County. And our guitar player lives up up north in Rhinelander or wherever the hell he lives. And, you know... I, it just sort of seemed remote, like a thing you just sort of talk about with the guys. Yeah, 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 we'll play another show. But then it was sort of like, well, you know, we ain't getting any younger. We should probably play another show if we're going to play another show. So we got back together. And we played, you know, Time Bomb Tom's birthday party, and it was great, and we had a great time. And then we decided, well, maybe we'll play like a show or two every year since then. So we played in Minneapolis in 2018 at uh, the 4th of July. And then 2019, Tom asked us to open for Mud Honey. Again, like Pretty all right bad. i mean boris and mud honey's kind of an odd bill but what the hell it was a cool show and then of course there was this pandemic and stuff and then we came back and played a few shows this year oh yeah the 30th anniversary show so it, it was just sort of one of those things that 
we got back together for just, you know, kind of like a weekend of fun and uh, felt right. We enjoyed it. We like playing music with each other. So we figured, well, why don't we just play a show or two every year and call it good? And then someone we wound up recording an album in that period as well. And you recorded that at uh, the memory, Crutch of Memory, right Not here in Not that Appleton. far from where we're sitting right now. Yeah. How about that? So this would be your first Boris project not recording with you know, a simple studio Eric number two, right? It's the first album that we did not record with Eric number two. Right. We recorded like our final 45 we recorded in Chicago and our first demo we recorded in Chicago um, because our, our drummer was friends with this gentleman, Dale, who owned a recording studio in Chicago. And that's where we started doing stuff. And that's where we ended doing stuff. What's my point? Oh, yes, that was our first album recorded elsewhere because Smart Studio, excuse me, Simple Studios, like Smart Studios, does not exist anymore. So we needed to find alternate recording arrangements. And you were a fan of Tenement. And well, who Tenement, isn't, yeah. by golly? And I always said they, they, rock pretty, they rock pretty hard for a band where the guitar player wears a sweater. Now I'm in a band where the entire band wears sweaters. Go figure. Yeah, so the Smart Shoppers. You're playing bass. And that was that kind of a, a nice thing to sort of step back and play an instrument and not be the, the main? You're probably still the main focus of the band. but I am not the main focus of the band <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. It, it, it really was. Um, jumping all around in my mind. Uh, after Boris sort of broke up or went into the thing where we just play a year or whatever, a year, once a year, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the hell it was, I just said that I can't remember anymore because this thing sucks the life out of my cerebrum. Um, I, I joined a band called the onions and the onions were a band from Manitowoc, Manitowoc punk band, a fine band. They're playing tonight actually at jam rock and on board art way, the weirdest street in green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, and I'm going to go see them, but I'm not in them. They were a band and we started for whatever reason, you know, there's that Halloween thing where you start where you do tributes to other bands. That's kind of kind of a common thing. I don't know if that's a Wisconsin thing or that's an everywhere thing, but uh, they were going to do a set of Dickie songs. So I'm like, well, you want to sing the Dickie songs? I'm like, yeah, all right. Uh, just give me a tape of the songs you want. I will show up and I will perform them with you. So we didn't practice. And then that went over so well that we wound up doing that Dickie's tribute set about four different times that year because people liked it and they wanted to play in Milwaukee and all this other crap. So I would show up and I would just sort of sing with this band, never practice with them, had a hard time remembering you know, the names of who was in the band and which guy was which and whatever. But I showed up and did my bit, did my Dickie songs. And then, you know, I was think I was unemployed at the time. They're like, well, you want to sing with the band full time? I'm like, hell yeah, let's do it. I don't have anything else to do. So I sang with them for a number of years and, you know, I'm kind of getting up in age and eventually it just wasn't any fun singing anymore. It wasn't any fun being a front man. I felt like I'd done everything thing that I really could possibly do. I mean, I've dressed in every rick and ridiculous costume I've had in the closet. I've said every god dang freaking loony thing off the top of my head. There's really nowhere for me to go with this but down. I'm going to be like little Richard and have somebody help him up on the piano so he can stand on the piano. I, I think it's just sort of time for me to call it a day. So I'm like, I don't okay. I don't want to do it. I don't want to sing anymore. Uh, I quit. You, you know, those guys are still the onions because they were the onions before me. They're the onions after me. They were Reverend Norb and the onions when I was with them. But, uh, I just, I, I just didn't want to do it anymore. It wasn't, wasn't fun for me to sing in a band anymore. I did it all my life. Didn't want to do it anymore. But um, when I was younger, I used to also play bass. So I thought, well, I'm going to... I always just had a crappy bass, like a you know, $100 or $200 bass. I'm like, I'm going to get a nice bass, a bass that I kind of like. So I got a Fender Music Master from about 1973. So that way I don't have excuses for not being able to play bass, except the usual excuse of not having any talent. I said, you know, maybe I'll play bass in a band at some point in time. I don't know. Then my next door neighbor, Joe, he's a singer of the Smart Shoppers. He's not my next door neighbor anymore but he used to be my next door neighbor he was like yeah i got this band and we're called you know we're, we're called the smart shoppers and and uh we got a gig booked and we don't have a bass player I'm like opportunity knocks so i sort of jumped on that and i, I really enjoy it i think that's it, it's a lot of fun for me to play bass in a way that it wasn't it wasn't fun for me to sing and i think if you played bass for 40 years or whatever the hell it is you probably want to sing because you're probably sick of playing bass other way with me i don't really want to sing boris show once or twice a year i can do that because that's always sort of a, like a big deal and i don't know i can think of new dumb things to say off the top of my head but as far as doing it regularly that's not really fun for me but playing bass is fun because i I I haven't scraped I haven't I haven't scraped uh, I, I haven't begun to tap my full potential actually I have I maxed out on my potential but uh, I don't know I don't know it's fun it's cool you are watching and listening to Fox City's Corn WCZR we are simulcast on to the station if you haven't checked out the station tune in to listen to it we're a fully licensed station now and it's way better than anything else you've listened to or can listen to so check it out uh, yeah Norb approved. I just got your uh, your endorsement on I thumbs up. I thumbs up. <laughs> um, Implicit endorsement. How did how did Boris break up? Like, what was 
you technically not broken up, but you said you're just kind of you're you're burned out on the Boris thing. Was it the the low level of energy? Is it just people being older and the the job commitments and the you know everything that goes into to being in a band gets unappealing as you kind of get up there. Uh, that's true. Uh, I think there were a lot of factors. Well, one thing is that, you know, Boris always, we, we maintained a pretty heavy playing schedule, even though we always kept our day job. So it was sort of like you get done with your 40 hours a week, you immediately get home on Friday evening or Friday afternoon, whatever it is, you throw your duffel bag and your equipment into the van, we go off, we play Milwaukee or Chicago, then you go off and you play Cleveland or wherever the hell on Saturday, and then you spend Sunday driving back. And Sunday night, you, you know, put your feet up and chill, and then you're back to work on Monday. And you'd, we, we would, you know, do this constantly for years. And that, that sort of takes a toll on people if they're trying to have a wife or they're trying to have a kid or they're trying to have some sort of a life. You really got to be committed to that kind of thing. And you can't really expect that level of commitment to go. Not everybody is going to be like totally gung ho on the band because they're going to have other things they want to do. They want to get married or they want to have a kid or they want to have a, you know, whatever, whatever the hell it is you want. So it, it, we would have a, a fair amount of like job member, job churn as they job churn, as they call it in the industry. We'd, we'd have like, you know, new members come in and things like that, because I don't know, that's just the way it sort of worked. And eventually, you know, you sort of get to the point where at the end of the band's life, it's kind of like the grandfather's axe theorem, where like if my grand, if, if the handle has been replaced three times and the head of the axe has been replaced twice, is that axe still handing, hanging on the wall, my grandfather's axe, if, if it's all been replaced. So it was sort of like, yeah, I don't know. It, it it just it just wasn't really clicking anymore. And at some point in time, if you're a punk band, you tend to you tend to appeal to a younger crowd, or at least you did uh, back back in the day when young people listened to music. Um, so you know the people that are teenagers, they've sort of aged out. Now they're in college, or they're they've got interests of their own. So you know the the trajectory of Boris was no longer on the uphill thing. It was it was clearly on the downhill slide. And then at that point in time, you're not really taking the band that seriously. You're just acting like it's bowling night. Oh, Wednesday night, time to practice with the band. Let's get some beers. Blah blah blah. And you're playing and you're drinking before you're playing and you're being all dumb and whatever. And it, you know there just wasn't that level of taking it seriously we could go you kind of you're kind of going in and you're punching the clock and you're playing your set and blah 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 and you can still get decent gigs or whatever but it's not like you're this this big thriving growing concern so it just sort of seemed like we were running in place and there it it, it, it i didn't really see any reason to continue it it just wasn't really happening so i kind of 2003 you kind of pulled the plug it's like all right enough's enough because you know if you if you keep going if you had something that was really cool and special and you just keep grinding it into the ground pretty soon it's not special at all like i don't think anybody that saw badfinger in 1985 or whatever said wow i saw badfinger and it was freaking awesome so um yeah it was just it was just time it was time expiration date i have forgotten the question but i hope i covered it in my torrent of verbal apple chip neo apple chip diarrhea you did very well at one point, you decided to put out a book. The At two points, voice. I decided to put out a book. <laughs> two points. The first one he put out was a, a kind of a deconstruction of the lyrics from, from all the Boris albums with uh, nice antidotes of where things came from. Um, a memoir, they call that. Was that because he thought that Boris was done? He wanted to just kind of, you know, here here is everything on, on Boris, you know, in the, there's this book. It's it's. How long did that take you to put together? By well, the way, well, I, I don't know because I was also unemployed at that point in time. But it was like I, I was I had this idea for like a I, I don't know I wanted to do like a some sort of a column and I wanted to like explain lyrics and I want to you know I write columns for various punk magazines and so on and so forth. I'm like, well, that would make a good column, you know, if I just wrote this sort of feature for a punk magazine and I explained all the lyrics. And then of course you go back and you listen to you know you, you got like 11 years of lyrics or whatever the hell. It's like, well, that's gonna that's gonna be more than you know a two page column in Razor Cake or whatever the hell. So I just started typing it up as a book and I. You know, it. I don't think it was going to be a book. Just in my head, it was just going to be a thing I was going to do. But then I just, it just snowballed. And I had, you know, you're, you're trying to explain where things came from. And then you're trying to explain where the band is. And pretty soon it's just, it's like 139,000 words. So it just sort of happened that way. So I don't know. It, it just kind of came out. And I don't know exactly how long it took me because I was unemployed. And you just do a little bit at a time. And pretty soon you got a book. And you're like, I got a book. Hooray. When Vespa de Venus came out, you, you, I like it because you added uh, online, yes, you, you added an extra section to make up that you could print off and add it to the book. So you felt like you were complete. Exactly. And that actually brought the footnote tally up over the thousand mark because <laughs> there were only, I think there were like 984 footnotes in the original or something like that because I would explain things by putting the little, the little, the little superscript numeral up there and then you would follow down to the bottom and, you know, you, 
I don't know. I don't know. There were a lot of footnotes. There were a lot of footnotes. It was sort of like the aesthetics of rock, if you're familiar with that one by Richard Meltzer. But uh, his book made sense and mine didn't. But um, yeah, I had like 984 footnotes or whatever the heck it was. And people were like, well, why didn't you just, you know, have 16 more footnotes and have a thousand footnotes? Because because the whole thing was, it wasn't like the comedic value of like having a lot of footnotes. Like the footnotes were just the way that was logically presented to me that I could explain what it is. There is not one single footnote that in, in excess that is simply there for the point of having a footnote. I needed 986 footnotes and exactly that many and whatever but now i'm over a thousand which has got to be a record because i had the little addendum you can go to boris the sprinkler.com and you can find this thing on there it's called what the hell is it called the deconstructed the the annotated vespa that's what it's called it's, you can download it as a pb pdf and i explain if you haven't got enough of me explaining my <laughs> song lyrics in a ma- major self-indulgent fashion you can go like you know you can get you can get the same treatment to the, the newer album that came out after the book i don't know why you would want to do that but you could um yes and there's a lot of footnotes if you like footnotes you'll love my book the second book was your columns from maximum rock and roll which was a a, a zine that was out uh, you wrote for it for a couple of years. I think there was like a couple hundred columns you did for that. Uh, there were, I don't know, it was about four years. It was from 1994 to 1998. And I collected the columns and I put them in a book. And I used guide words, which really excited me because I put I put everything in two columns on a page and I used guide words. For some reason, like, like the first book used a lot of footnotes. I was really into the idea of footnotes. And the second one, I didn't want to use footnotes because there's already a zillion billion words in that book anyway. And they're shrunk down really tiny. So I wanted to use guide words like an encyclopedia. And that's the type of thing that thrills me. Thrills me. Well, I remember... I remember checking that one out, like getting one of those at some place down in Appleton. And you had a column. Brian Zero had a column um, from the band Siren. Oh, I and, remember. Wasn't he in the the Volatiles? I'm not sure, but I mean, it was They've so been cool. Thinking of like, a long guy. Like yes. with the internet now, I, I, a good question for you is now it's like everything can get put on the internet. Back then, I mean, you were in this, you know, syndicated zine. And it, how did you find out about music back in the day? I mean, you really had to do the footwork. There was a, you, you really had to, I mean, if you didn't live in some major cultural hub, and I assure you that Northeastern Wisconsin is not a major cultural hub, you really had to be adept at working the mail system. You had to write to people and get a mail order catalog. You had to send away. You had to, you, you really had to be, Louis DeJoy, be damned, I tell you, you had to really run them. You, you had to really work with the USPS a lot, and you would. You know, you have to send people zines and you'd have to mail order records and you'd have to do this and that. And you'd have to obtain addresses because obtaining street addresses was really important back then. Because otherwise, how would you know where to write for for the catalog and so on and so forth? So that's what you had to do. As far as like booking shows and networking, I guess same thing. You play a, a show with a band, you have to get their phone number. We're going to call here too. So let's. Uh... Sure. Yeah. Hey, Norb, this is Sam Beaton. Hey, I've got a one part question for you. Does it involve the Cecil yeah, girls? I my keys at your house the other night. Pardon me? Did I leave my keys at your house the other night? I have not found your like your keys at my house, Sam. But I, I will redouble my efforts. Okay. Did you lose a Pez dispenser? Because I found a Pez dispenser. That would not be mine. All right, then. Keys. All right, man. Thanks so much, guys. Peace out, homie. All right, just like that. <laughs> have you ever had a call quite like that before? No, but the Pez dispenser, did it have Pez in it? No, it did not. I was like, you know, I, I gave a... Uh, the, 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 final, the guitar player in the final Boris lineup was uh, LP. It was not his real name, but uh, I gave him a ride, and we went to a, I don't know, I gave him a ride the other day. And when he left, I was looking for something or another in the car, and I found a Pez dispenser. And I'm like, this is not my Pez dispenser. I do not have a Batman Pez dispenser. I don't have one in my car. Where the heck can the Batman Pez dispenser come from? It did not spontaneously generate. And I dug around, and I found this Pez dispenser, and I called LP. I said, LP, is this your Pez dispenser? And he said no. So I have not found keys, but I have found a Batman Pez dispenser that I cannot account for. I don't know how a Batman Pez dispenser got in my car, but if you lost that Batman Pez dispenser... Let me know. Call me right here. We, Operators are standing by. We did have a, a question. Somebody wondered if you're wearing the striped pants. You don't have to answer that, though. Well, uh, just maybe the imagination is better. Well, uh, federal regulations indicate that I cannot be shown from the waist down due to the fact that I may be arrested for inciting a riot or other lascivious conduct. So... No. I, I, ch- I checked. I, I, I went online and I checked to see if like, you'd be shooting me from the waist down before I decided how I was going to dress. The answer is no. I'm not even wearing pants. But I do have stripes markered on my legs. Where should people go if they want to find out more about the smart shoppers? And then 
follow-up question is boris ever going to do another show boris are going to ever do another show i would imagine we don't have anything booked i'm not sure what we're going to do next but we're going to do something it'll and it'll it'll be fab i tell you smart shoppers are playing at the lyric room in november with mad mojo jet from minneapolis and holly and the nice lions and i forget the exact date of that show i want to say it's the 19th but that could be a lie <laughs> it's november i've got the month hammered down where would you send people to if they want to find out more about Rev Norb? Me? I don't know. I'm on Facebook like all the other schmucks. Do you like being on Facebook? Do you like dealing with social media? Uh, I don't mind Facebook because it gives me a platform to like babble whatever the heck my loony idea is off the top of my head of the day or whatever it is. Or if I want to take a picture of some ridiculous costume, although you'll find this hard to believe, but sometimes I like wearing ridiculous clothing. Uh, I don't know. I, it sort of gives me, it gives the illusion that you're communicating with people. So that's, you know. Without actually having to communicate with people all that much if you don't want to. So that's nice. That's convenient. Kind of circling back on what we were talking about before. So it's easy now for people to reach out. Like back in the 90s, people would have to go to shows to talk to you or you know to see you. Now people can just message you online and say, hey, do you want to do a podcast or do this or that? Do you like that easy access or do you like it better back in the day when you're more of a kind of a mystery? Um, I guess I kind of like it this way because it, it, it takes a lot less effort this way. You can, you know, you can communicate and be in contact with a, a vast ar array and variety of people before you really had to be sort of a sort of a pioneer and you had to be dedicated to the cause. You had to go places and you had to meet people and it was sort of, you know, it, it was all very, I don't want to say it was exclusive, but there was, it was a lot, it, things were a lot more tightly knit because you really had to go meet people and now you can just sort of. They can be your, you know, you can friend them on Facebook and you can be somebody's Facebook friend without actually having to travel to a different city and meet them and know them and remember their name and all that kind of crap. So there's a certain amount due, due to the like the, the, the volume of humans that, with which one can interact these days. You know, maybe the experience is not quite as valuable or it's not quite as intense. You don't really feel like you're, you know, you're doing a Vulcan soul bond with the people that you're necessarily Facebook friends with. But uh there's more, so it's more of a volume thing, I guess. It's kind of like 20 apple, ch 20 apple chips instead of one apple chip. I don't know. One bad apple chip doesn't spoil the whole bunch, baby. Are there any bands in the scene right now, in the Fox City, Green Bay scene, that you would suggest people go check out that are... Yes, they're all awesome. All oh, good answer. Are there any that are not awesome? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. not, not on my watch. My very last question for you, Nor. What is the one thing over your 40 years of music that you're the most proud of? that I'm the most proud of in 40 years of music. <sighs> wow. Really? I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to answer that because I have, I, I, I'm, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to say it was the, the Boris, the sprinkler, Neo spectacular 30 year anniversary or Rama or whatever the hell we called it. That last show that we had, the show that we had for our 30th anniversary in late June. Um, that was really awesome. That was great. That was wonderful because I don't know. I sort of, I often take sort of a dimmer view of the importance of Boris than someone like, say, Paul Number One, our guitar player, does. And he was like, "Oh yeah, we're 30th anniversary. We're gonna have this big show, and we're gonna put it on at the, you know, we're gonna, I don't know, we're gonna, it, we're, gonna we're gonna do it at the Green Bay Distillery, and it's gonna be this all day thing, and it's gonna be, you know, I don't know, twenty dollars to get in or whatever. We're gonna have all these bands playing. And I'm like, oh, Paul, you're freaking kidding me. I, I don't want to, you know, we don't want a headline, headline. I mean, I'm old, and I've been playing for 30 years, and people don't want to see that crap anymore. And then place was packed full of people and they wanted to see that crap and we played great and it was all wonderful and i was really touched and humbled by how many people came out and said nice things and the crowd reaction was great so i'm just gonna say that that was awesome if you were there thank you very much norm thank you for doing the show today thank you. I appreciate it, it <laughs> been a been a fan for quite some time it's nice to sit down and learn more about you and kind of meet meet the man uh, behind the legend i use the term legend very strongly there and I look forward to hearing what else you have coming in the future. Like in the Smart Shoppers, if people haven't checked them out, um, they're really good. Um, go check out the Smart Shoppers. Huzzah! This is out. Uh, we're listening to him in the headphones right now. This That's is, a good place for him. Yeah. <laughs> this is a little Smart Shoppers for you. So thanks, Norb. You've thanks. Been, thanks for having me. You've been watching Fox City's Core on WCZR New Rock for New Radio. Code, Daylight time, not Central Time. <laughs> Code Zero Radio.